Hey, everybody. If you want to start making your way in here, that would be great. Good morning. So I'll warn you up front, I'm dealing with a little bit of a cold, so I'm all hopped up on cold medication, and I don't, I don't really check the dosages, so I just kind of, so who knows how this is going to go. It'll be fun either way. <clears throat> uh, okay, so you can turn to <clears throat> Genesis 12, verse 1. If you have your Bibles and you want to get there. Uh, so happy first week of Advent. For this Advent season, we're just going to continue on our Values in the Kingdom series. Um, we are on our second of six core values here at the Upper Room. The ones we're looking at now is accessing abundant wholeness. And you can, you can find all these values and their definitions at our website, yourfellowship.com. And I just want to read the definition of this value again. Okay, so I think we have it up there. Yep, accessing abundant wholeness. We thrive in complete joy and are able to live from abundance because Jesus loves us and paid for everything we need by his work on the cross, opening the way for our complete salvation, complete healing, and complete deliverance. Accessing abundant wholeness is about salvation, healing, deliverance, healing up spiritual and emotional wounds and baggage that we carry with us, and deliverance from unhealthy, non-kingdom patterns and thoughts. Last week, we looked at emotional health. Uh, Today, we're going to look at generational sins, which sounds pretty heavy, but I promise we're heading toward hope today. And with all these, like one one sermon is not going to sort everything out in your life, so these are just kind of a way to open the door and start to think about these things, okay? So, okay, so let's read some Bible. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. We're going to read a ton, so if you don't want to follow along, you can just read up there. Uh, The Lord had said to Abram, all right, so who's later named Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So this story, the story of Abram or Abraham, is front and center in the story of God. It's about how God calls this random guy named Abram. We know nothing about him at all. Random dude out in the desert, and he called God calls him to be the vehicle for his saving, healing, life-giving love to flow through the world. And so God makes Abraham a promise. I will bless you so that all families on earth will be blessed through you. So not bad for a random guy out in the desert. Verse 4, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. So off he goes. He leaves behind his home, leaves behind his job, leaves behind his safety and security, and he chases after God's call. But that does not mean that he had it all together. Skip down to 10. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. And and as he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, which would later be named Sarah, I know what a beautiful woman you are. And if you've never read the story, you're thinking, oh, he's romantic. (laughs) Nope, not really. Keep reading. (laughs) I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. So, say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abraham's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Here's your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. So in this story, Abram tells his wife Sarai to lie to Pharaoh and put her neck on the line so that he would be safe and would make a whole bunch of money. So he's a cunning entrepreneur and a lying sexist jerk of a husband to his wife. And this is not a one-time slip-up. Turn over to chapter 20. Fast forward a few years, chapter 20, verse 1. 
Now Abraham, Abraham, now he's Abraham, moved on from there into the region of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. For a while he stayed in Gerar. Gerar. And there Abraham said to his wife Sarah, said of his wife Sarah, she's my sister. So exact same thing. Then Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent for Sarah and took her. Sound familiar? But God came to Abimelech in a dream one night and said to him, You are as good as dead because of the woman you have taken. She is a married woman. And the story continues on. So that wasn't a one-time slip-up. This is an ongoing habitual sin in Abraham's life. And it lives on in Abraham's son. Son, turn over to chapter 26, a few pages to the right. Abraham has a son named Ishmael, not from Sarah, but from Sarah's servant, which is weird, right? And then later, in her old age, Sarah has a son named Isaac. And then we read the story about Isaac when he's all grown up. Chapter 26, verse 1. It says, Now there was a famine in the land, besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. So, so different time, but the exact same king in the exact same place. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, my instructions. So Abraham passes down the promise that God made. This, this, this promise of I will bless you so that you will be a blessing to all the nations on earth. He passed it down as an inheritance to his son, Isaac. That's all fantastic, but watch what happens. Verse 7. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, She is my sister, because he was afraid to say, She is my wife. He thought the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebekah, because she is beautiful. Sound familiar? Exact same king, exact same place, like father, like son. The sin lives on. And guess what? It lives on in Isaac's children as well. Turn the page to chapter... No, don't. Just read up here. Chapter 27. It's a lot. Isaac has twin sons. The oldest is a dude named Esau. You know the story. The younger by a minute or two is Jacob. They do not get along. We read this in chapter 27, verse 18. So this is a couple decades later, or however long. Uh, This is Jacob. He went to his father and said, My father. Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau. Your first burn, warn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. The blessing here is the inheritance, the promise that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and his sons. Isaac asked his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord your God gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to, said to Jacob, Come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. So Isaac's elderly. He's blind by this point in time. You probably know the story. Here is Jacob ripping him off. Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who touched him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau? He asked. I am, he replied, lying through his teeth. And this lie is the first of many. He essentially becomes a con man. His name Jacob in Hebrew literally means deceiver. And that is exactly what he becomes. So not only does the sin live on from Abraham to Isaac and then Jacob, but it seems to be getting worse, not getting better. And it lives on in Jacob's children. Turn over. No, just read it. One more generation. Stay with me a few minutes. Chapter 37. Jacob grows up and has a bunch of sons. Two are from his first love, this woman named Rachel. The rest are from other wives. Then we read this in chapter 37, verse 2. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of two of his wives, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. So he's the youngest, he's the baby in the family, and shocking, he's a tattletale. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. So Israel's another name for Jacob because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. 
So verse 31. So not, not long after that, Joseph's out in the field with his brothers who are shepherds. They're all alone. They capture him. They're about to murder little brother Joseph. But instead, they realize we can make money off this guy. So they sell him into slavery in Egypt. And then, true to form, they spin a lie around it. Chapter 37, verse 31. Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. So we see a pattern start to emerge in Abraham, and then his son Isaac, then his grandson Jacob, and then his great-grandsons. First off, we see lying. Abraham lies about Sarah, not once but twice, and Isaac does the exact same thing about his wife, Rebecca. Uh, Jacob lies all over the place, including to his own dad's face. Then Jacob's son lied to Jacob's face about Joseph, a lie that goes uncovered for years. And then we see misogyny, sexual addiction. It starts with Abraham sleeping with Sarah's servant, who was essentially a sex slave at the time. Then it seems to skip a generation. Isaac, as far as we can tell, is a good husband to his wife, Rachel. But then Jacob is a full-on polygamist. He ends up having... Twelve sons from four wives. And then out of that, we see third, favoritism. Abraham favors Ishmael over Isaac, and it causes problems. Isaac favors Esau over Jacob. Jacob favors Joseph over all his other sons. And then because of that, we naturally see sibling rivalry. There's a rift between Ishmael and Isaac that ends up with Ishmael getting kicked out of the family. Jacob and Esau are at each other's throats. Jacob steals his birthright or his inheritance, the promise God made to Abraham. He steals it away. And as a result, Esau says, you're going to die with my bare hands. And then Jacob's sons sell Joseph into slavery. So we see sin that lives on from one generation to the next. And this pattern isn't unique to Abraham and his family. You see the same sort of pattern in David and his family. Let's look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. This is God talking. He says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Okay, so it might help a little bit to know what the word jealous there means. When it says, I am a jealous God, we humans sometimes get jealous, right? Which means we get, we get possessive, we get petty about stuff like that. That's, that's not what the word means here. The word jealous as it is used here is to be zealous to protect something. God is zealous for his people. What God is zealous for is that is the well-being of his people in the honor of his name. That's why God is jealous. Because he doesn't want his people chasing after false gods. Because that's not good for them and it desecrates his name. So it's not like petty jealousy. It's being zealous to protect something that's extremely valuable. But what does it mean when he says that he punishes the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation? What's interesting about this is it goes against what the Bible says in other places. So for example, it says in Ezekiel 18, it says the child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. So, you're not responsible for your parents' sin, and they're not responsible for your sin. So in that sense, it's an individual thing. So how do we put these things together? Where on one hand, you're only morally responsible for what you do, and on the other hand, the sin of the parents is passed down, and somehow we're punished for it. What do we do with this? To explain, I think we need to understand uh, that the word translated punish there in Hebrew literally means to visit, to visit. In fact, some translations just leave it like that, like the Lord visits the sin of the parents on the third and fourth generation, but 
What's that really mean? You visit the sin on the third and fourth generation. What it refers to is that God shows up. God visits. God is there. So probably the best translation, I think, is the one that's found in the New English translation. It translates this passage this way. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, responding to the transgressions of the fathers by dealing with children to the third and fourth generations. The point here is that the sin of the forefathers and foremothers is passed down and experienced in some way to the third and fourth generation, but God will always be there to deal with it. God doesn't just say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm out of here. No, he deals with it. He may discipline, but he's always picking up the pieces, turning evil into good, bringing about his redemptive purposes. So there are really three things that we need to understand about generational sin. First, Generational sin is a real thing, just like DNA or genetics are passed down from parent to child, or to be more precise, the bent towards certain sin is passed down. So a child will be bent like his or her parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. They will have an inner inclination toward the same certain sinful habits. Secondly, we need to understand that sin has consequences that last for generations. Now, this, this understanding of generational sin is really contrary to our Western worldview. Because we tend to think of sin and morality as strictly an individual thing. My sin's about me. Now, I may suffer from it, but it's about me. And the Bible has a much more holistic perspective. In fact, almost every culture throughout history until the modern West, Western culture has had a more holistic perspective. I think a more accurate perspective. And that is that what you do affects other people, sometimes as far as three or four generations down the line. I mean, in some sense, we're all still experiencing the impact of what Adam and Eve did. There's ripple effects to what we do. There is a ripple effect and collateral damage on your family. And third, God says that on a scale of God's mercy and judgment, mercy wins every time, right? Right? So in the text we read that God punishes the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. But God shows love or mercy to what? Thousand generations. So in your mind's eye, right, imagine a scale. On one side is God's justice to the third and fourth. On the other side is God's love to a thousand generations. Is God a God of justice? Yes. But God's heart is to show love and mercy to you. And the idea with God punishing his children for the sins of the parents simply means our family of origin has a massive bearing on who we are today. We all carry the good and the bad from our past into our present and maybe even into our future. I mean, Abraham, for example, made a lot of mistakes, but he was still an outstanding man, right? Father Abraham had many sons. Most of them were dysfunctional and screwed up. We keep that part out of the song, right? But he was still an outstanding man. So he passed on the sins of lying, misogyny, sexual addiction, favoritism, all that. And he passed on the promise that God made. I will bless you so that you will be a blessing to all the people on earth. Talk about an inheritance. Like you get to actually rescue the entire world. We all carry both an inheritance and generational sin. So... What do we do about that? Well, God's able to redeem the brokenness of our stories. God will always be there visiting to bring redemption and redemptive value out of them. But he does not erase them, which means there's work for us to do. In order for us to become the people God intends us to be, we have to identify and understand how our family history and our family and our, in our history is directly impacting how we're loving God, how we're loving and interacting with other people. So once we realize that our past, whether it be our family or past events, whatever has shaped us into the people that we are today, we have to, in order to access abundant wholeness as a church, and as men and women, we need to break the power of the past. We need to break the chain of generational sin. Some of us believe or maybe are thinking even that by, by looking at our past, or bringing up stuff from the past, we're really going to dishonor our parents in doing that. You know, I don't want to stir the pot. 
But I want you to hear me on this. Honoring your parents or your grandparents doesn't mean you ignore their sin or their weakness or their life or how it's impacted yours. In order for us to be healthy people, to be a church that accesses abundant wholeness, we need to break free from the power of the past so that we can live a life that moves forward. So how? First, you need to see it. Meaning you need to identify it. Identify the generational sin. And for some of you, that's probably like crystal clear. There's like a distinct pattern in your family. Everybody gets divorced. All the men are angry. All the women are mean. Whatever it is. But for others of you, it's not crystal clear, right? It's a bit tricky at times. So you ask the question. You ask yourself and you ask God, who are the people and what are the events that have shaped me into who I am today? Do some listening prayer. The psalmist prayer is an excellent template for this. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me to the way of everlasting. I think God will be faithful to reveal that to you. And just set aside some time and pray and wait on God. And also at this point, it might be helpful to get some wise godly counsel, someone you can work through these things with. So that's first, identifying the family patterns of sin and dysfunction. And then secondly, you own it. Meaning, you take responsibility. So the point of looking at your past isn't the blame shift. The idea is here isn't to get mad at your daddy. Asking questions about the past is okay, but if we don't end up at a place of responsibility where we say, hey, I choose not to be a victim no matter what was handed to me, we will never break the power of the, that sin. Period. We sing the song, I'm no victim, right? Why do we sing that song? Because victims never walk in peace. Victims don't move forward. And victims are never able, are never able to inspire others. What happens is we have a we have to choose the mentality of a victor. Romans 8:37, right? We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. And the victor mentality is no matter what was handed to me, no matter how wrong it was, no matter how bad it was. I get to choose right here what's coming from me going forward. I get to choose what I'm going to do about the sin that was handed to me. And I want to say this. The worst thing that you can do with sin in general, and generational inset habitual sin in particular, is hide it or sweep it under the rug or deny it or justify it. I don't really have a problem. I don't really have an anger problem. The worst thing you can do is keep it a secret. Because secrets have power. They have authority over you. They keep you enslaved to wrong thinking and then wrong living. But when secrets are dragged into the light, we see them for what they really are, right? Weak and defeatable. And most of the time, a flat-out lie. So we own it. And then we identify it, we own it, and then we break it. We break the cycle. Identify it, own it, break the cycle. The good news is that sin, now becoming a part of me, is not automatic. In Jesus' name, it is a choice that we make to repeat the sins of our forefathers. In Ezekiel 18, there's another scripture verse about an an ancient saying that broke out uh, around a misunderstanding of God's nature. The saying that broke out was that if your teeth are set on edge, it must be because your father ate sour grapes. Okay, That was a way of saying... If I'm living bad, don't blame me. It was my dad. Don't blame me. It was my mom. And God said this in Ezekiel 18 too. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. He's saying that's not how it works. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. For everyone belongs to me, the parent as well as the children. Both alike belong to me. The one who sins is the one who will die. He said, everybody has to understand this. You all ultimately have a choice. We're not going to say that weird proverb anymore. And even though it's going to be a lot easier for you to choose family sin, it's going to be a lot more natural. It'll happen really without you even thinking about it. You still ultimately have a choice to disrupt the pattern. At any point. How's it happen? How's it work? This this power of family origin is strong, right? Right? You know what's even more powerful than that? 
power of adoption and being brought into a new family through the blood of Jesus Christ. And through his willingness to accept you into his family, you become a part of a whole brand new family where essentially you get a new DNA sequence. You are made new. And that is what the difference between three or four generations of iniquity and a thousand of love is. Back, back in Exodus chapter 20, let's look at it again. Verse 5, I punish the children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But verse 6, I show love to a thousand generations. You realize God is essentially putting a limiter on how far sin can travel. What he's saying is my actual desire is to show love. My love that's unleashed on the world through my promise to send someone to adopt you, save you, heal you, bring you into a new family, give you a new choice, give you a new future, give you a new home, give you a new calling, give you new gifts, new birthright, all that. My love runs unchecked for a thousand generations. So you have Abraham to Isaac to Jacob being a deceiver, you have the ten sons of that fourth generation conspiring together to do harm to, to the son Joseph. What's Joseph do with all that was handed to him? Deceit, betrayal, hatred, all these evil things handed to Joseph. What does he do with it? Joseph chooses to write a new story. Joseph chose to tap into a new birthright handed him. Not through his earthly parents, but through his heavenly father, when he chose to forgive, when he chose not to harbor evil against his brothers. He never said what they did was good, but he chose to believe God's doing something good in what was done to me, in what was taken from me. Joseph was handed the script, the same old boring old script. Get mad, be passive-aggressive, get even, eye for an eye, he was handed the same script that his forefathers got. And when they got it, they just said the part that was on the page. And a lot of us, that's the problem. We just do exactly what our mom did to our dad in marriage or whatever it is. We just get handed the same script through our DNA and we just play our part. But Joseph, he tore up that old script. He chose to say, I see a different part for myself. I'm not a victim. I'm a victor. Yes, what you did to me was wrong. I'm acknowledging that it was wrong. And that put me here. But guess what? God had something bigger he was doing. So, I chose to walk in mercy. And so in Jesus' power, I'm going to unleash something that's going to go for a thousand generations. Carl Jung said it so well. He said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life. So it was with Joseph. What you did to me was bad, but I forgive you. What you did to me was wrong, but I see God had a plan in the midst of what's wrong. If you will allow the name of Jesus to cancel the curses and break the chains that bind you, you can then be postured to be a part of a, re a renewed godly heritage that God will never put a limiter on and he'll let that sucker flow a thousand generations. So my story is um, that I come from a line of men who struggled with depression, paranoia, anger, suicide, a lot of suicide. And they gave me great things too, but that means like everyone in this room, I have issues that I have to constantly submit to the Lord and submit to the Spirit in and ask the Spirit for continued healing and continued work. And my thought is that I'll probably wrestle with some of those things until I get to go into the ground. But maybe my kids won't have to. Maybe the cycle stops with me. The fact is that your, your biological family does not have to determine your future. You can take the good, leave the bad behind. You're not a victim, not in the kingdom of God. No matter what has been done to you, you are not powerless. Right. 
the power that raised Jesus from the dead is coursing through your veins. It's in you from the Holy Spirit. And you can, with the help of God, take all the good from your family of origin and your past and carry it on to your children. Should God bless you with that. And your children's children. And your children's children's children. And you can take all the crud and baggage and pain and dysfunction and sin that you carry with you from your past and you can cut ties and let it go and walk away. Into God's future for you. You know, God's specialty is taking stories Messy, complex, sticky stories and making something beautiful out of them. My prayer is that we as God's people, we would trust him with our past so that we can find freedom today in our present and in the days ahead. All right. That's the cold medicine talking, don't worry. A little emotional. So let's all stand up. Can we stand up? Let's pray together. Um, If the ministry team wants to come forward, we're going to pray. If this is something, like I said, this is just one sermon. This isn't going to fix it. But if there's something here that's like, ooh, um, come get prayed for, okay? Holy Spirit, would you please move? Please do a healing work. We need freedom. We need hope. We need your comfort. We need your... Encouragement, Holy Spirit. We need you. Above all, we need your healing presence, God. God, we ask that you meet us as a community. We thank you for the, just the resurrected Jesus, Lord, who takes all of our sins and shortcomings and does away with them, covers over them, removes them, forgives them. We ask you now to give us great wisdom in the ways in which we have bought into narratives and scripts and stories and voices and the beliefs that are destructive. We ask you to give us a vision into what accessing abundant wholeness looks like for us and what it looks like to be given a new day, a new heart, a new mind, a new new belief, a new pattern, a new cycle, be part of a new family. Please confront us with the reality that Jesus invites us to have full life, vibrant life, overflowing life. God, please rescue us from mediocrity, from complacency, for just for settling for the script that was handed to us. We ask that you would speak to us now fresh words. In the strong name of Jesus, everybody said, Amen. 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 Come on forward.